My Daddy, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a literally cultured read aloud, written by Martin Luther King III and illustrated by A.G. Ford. My sister Yolanda, who we called Yoki, and I wanted to go to Fun Town more than anything. Well, kids, you know Daddy's working very hard so that you and all children can go to Fun Town. But it's not possible today, Daddy would say. Maybe next week. But that week never came. You just don't want to take us, Yoki wailed. And finally, my mother explained we were not allowed in Fun Town. The rides and the roller coasters were for white people only. That's how it was when I was growing up. My dad fought to change that. At home though, my father was just dad. He tossed the football with me, taught me how to shoot hoops, teased me and played with me. He would lift me up and put me on top of the refrigerator. I imagined swinging from the ceiling fan as if I were flying in my own airplane. Then I would let daddy catch me as I fell into his arms. Away from home, things were different. It wasn't always easy being the son of Martin Luther King Jr. What's your name? The two older boys asked. I don't remember, I said. I forgot. I knew it was wrong to lie. Why'd you say that, Marty? My mother asked later. You know your name. It's your father's name. I knew, and I knew why I hadn't said my name, because I was afraid. Some people didn't like my father's work. He was stirring up trouble, they said. My father never stole anything or hurt anyone. Even so, he was thrown in jail more than 30 times. He had the courage to stand up and say, this law is unfair. And sometimes he was arrested for that. Once a neighbor was driving me home from school. On the radio, we heard that the Reverend Martin Luther King and about 80 other people had been thrown in jail. I was terrified. I ran inside my house crying and asked my mother, why did daddy go to jail? What did he do wrong? My mother hugged me. Your dad went to jail to help people, she told me. Some people don't have enough to eat or comfortable homes or clothes to wear. They are not as fortunate as we are. Daddy went to jail to make it possible for all people to have these things. Don't worry, Daddy will be coming back. I carried her words close to my heart. A year later, when Daddy was arrested again, Yoki was afraid that he wouldn't be back for Christmas. This time, I was the one who consoled her. Don't cry, Yoki. Daddy will be back. He has to help the people. He has already helped some people, but he has to help some more. And when he finishes, he'll be back. My father was not the only one in danger. Many people were hurt or even killed as they tried to change unfair laws. Once, as I marched in a protest, I saw a pretty lady with a bandage over her nose. My mother explained that she had been attacked by a police officer. The marches were peaceful, but that didn't stop people from trying to hurt them. Even police officers sprayed marchers with fire hoses or turned dogs on them. Later, a police officer came up to us with a huge dog that growled at me. I was terrified. 
It's okay, Marty, my dad told me as he took my hand. And I felt safe. My dad was not a tall man, but he always made me feel like he was a giant. I was never afraid when I was with him. No matter how bad it got, my dad never fought back. We must meet violence with nonviolence. We must meet hate with love, he always said. Nonviolence wasn't just for marches and protests, it was for home as well. One Christmas, my brother, Dexter, and I got toy guns for presents. Most of the other boys in the neighborhood played with guns, and we wanted to be just like them. But we knew that guns were wrong. They were not toys. They were machines made to hurt and kill. Together, the whole family took the guns outside, made a bonfire, and destroyed them. That night, as my brother and I watched our gifts burn, we believed we were destroying all the hate in the world. One bonfire couldn't fix everything, but some things were getting better, like the law that kept black and white children from going to the same school. When I was in third grade, that law was finally changed. My mother told Yoki and me that we'd be going to a new school in September. I didn't want to be the new kid who sat alone. Yoki felt the same way. We don't want to go, we complained. We don't want to be the only black kids at the school. My mother said she'd see what she could do. The day before school started, we found out that our three friends, the Abernathys, would be going with us to Spring Street School. I was glad to have my friends and my sister with me because when we got to the school, there were flash bulbs going off and TV cameras everywhere. Why did reporters want to talk to us? We were just kids going to school like everybody else. We were each in different classrooms. It was strange to be the only black kid in my class. I felt like everyone was staring at me the whole day. One kid even made a nasty comment. Wouldn't you rather go to school with your own kind? He asked, why aren't you at your own school? We're all the same kind. We're all kids. And Spring Street is my school now, I said. My father fought for us to be just kids attending the same schools. It was what he meant when he said he dreamed of his children being judged by the content of our character, not by the color of our skin. <laughs>